there are movies that I watch over and over again. You know, when you can't find what you really want to watch and you hit guide and then you scroll through those upper channels and they've got just old movies on. A lot of times I do that just to hear Gina say, you're not going to watch that again, are you? How many times have you actually seen that movie? And so some of the ones I, I ended up stopping was ones I watched my dad watch. You know, I'd love, I'll stop at a John Wayne movie. You know, I mean, I'm still a big Sons of Katie Elder fan. Thank you, Chris. Rio Bravo. I had to find someone old enough to, to get with me. Um, and, and war movies. I'll watch an old war movie over and over and again. But there, uniquely, there are two specific movies that I just end up can't ever scroll past. One is The Last of the Mohicans with Daniel Day-Lewis. Right? Some of you, but just odd, right? Just random. And then, and then The Last Samurai. I like watching The Last Samurai. So, so thank you. So for those who haven't, haven't endured some of these old movies, uh, and it's, it's odd saying an old movie and it being color, actually. But an old movie would be, so Tom Cruise's character in The Last Samurai, he is a, he's a military cavalry officer who has been hired by the emperor of Japan to train their troops in modern warfare. Um, but as the story goes, we start learning that, that the emperor has an advisor that's taking the country a little bit too far west in its thinking. And the samurai, the, the ancient um, warrior and protector of Japan um, has a leader named Katsumoto, and Katsumoto is leading an uprising to try to try to recapture the the the, ki the kingdom. Um, and so, Cruz, through a series of events, ends up moving from the trainer of the uh, of their army to actually then fighting with the samurai. Um, in the last epic battle of the film, uh, Katsumoto dies. Cruz is Injured terribly, but he survives. The last scene of the movie is Cruz hobbling into the emperor's throne room and awkwardly getting down on knee, offering him Katsumoto's sword. The emperor is moved, comes down off of his throne. And, and in this culture, and I know this is just cinema, but still in this culture, the emperor was a god. Comes down from his throne. He kneels down near um, Cruz and says, were you with him when he died? And Cruz says, yes. He said, tell me how he died with a tear streaming down his face. An epic line, Cruz looks, at him, looks up at him and he says, I will tell you how he lived. It's an amazingly poignant, a poignant line in the film. Basically what Cruz is saying is, how he lived tells you how he died. The, the, the actions of his death are nearly significant of, of his, the, what brought him to the point of dying in that manner. It brings us to our summer series called King of Kings, Jesus According to Matthew. This is my fun. I love preaching over the summer when we just take a book and we go through it stem to stern. Um, and we're going to do that this summer through the book of Matthew. Um, I understand that Jesus' death and resurrection are the linchpins of Christianity. That without his death, there is no forgiveness of sins. Without his resurrection, there is no life and no power to live it. I understand that. But it is the life of Jesus that we learn what takes him to this point of, of death. Um, so Matthew um, writes as a Jewish author writing to a Jewish audience. Every author, especially in the Gospels, there was a target audience of who they're writing to and purposes in which they wanted to kind of uh, convey. And that's why you will see different accounts in the Gospels of things included in one and not included in the other. It's because the author had a specific purpose and one fit the purpose and one didn't in another Gospel. So part of Matthew's purpose here is to establish Jesus as king. And we'll use king and Messiah. They're basically, there they're really are interchangeable words here. And Matthew wants to establish to his Jewish readers that Jesus is the king, the Messiah, who was promised in all the Old Testament prophecies they would have read. Now, why would he need to do that? It's because Jesus had a king credibility problem in the first century. He did. First, he was born to a working class family. He wasn't born in a royal family. 
He was born in a working class family. People knew who Joseph and Mary were. They knew what Joseph did. They knew what Jesus did growing up, right? He was the kid with the lawnmower and mowed the grass for five bucks. I mean, I mean, they, they, knew, they knew Jesus. And so Jesus had a king credibility problem. There's no possible way this kid is Jesus, that this Jesus kid is the Messiah. So the first chapter of Matthew takes us through what is known as a birth narrative. It's the ancient ancestry dot com or whatever, right? Because he's he's tracing he's tracing Jesus through Joseph, his father, tracing him through the line and the lineages to get him to David. David, the king in which someone from David's family would always rule in Israel. A promise God had made to David. And then we trace them back to Abraham. So Matthew 1 is all about addressing Jesus' king credibility problem that he wasn't born in the right family. Chapter 2 of Matthew addresses that Jesus' hometown wasn't known as a good place to come from, right? So Jesus was born on the wrong side of the tracks, in the wrong neighborhood, the wrong side of town. In fact, there's a line in one of the Gospels that says, can anything good come out of Nazareth? So Matthew chapter 2 what Matthew's trying to do is say, yeah, he's from Nazareth, but he was born in Bethlehem, and this is how it took place. And if you remember, Jewish family, the Savior, the Messiah, the King, was going to be born in Bethlehem. And in fact, this is where he was born, in Bethlehem, and this is how he gets to Nazareth. Matthew was addressing a king credibility problem. And the third thing here is, that Matthew unpacks throughout his whole gospel, is Jesus had an identity issue basically on terms of his temperament. Jesus did not have a king temperament. I mean, kings were about garnering armies and power, and Jesus was about neither. Jesus came with power, and he he came to serve. Kings don't come to serve. Kings come with pomp and circumstance. Jesus doesn't come with pomp pomp and circumstance. So Matthew writes his gospel. In fact, 60% of the book of Matthew are Jesus' words. 60%. Less commentary, more direct quotations from Jesus, because Matthew is establishing his behavior, his actions, his teachings, to say, this is the king, this is the Messiah. The life application uniquely of chapter 3, Jesus only says a few words in chapter 3. The life application for this message series, and I think the book of Matthew in chapter 3, would be the context in which we read these accounts, the characters that are described in this account in Matthew 3, and how they intersect, how they connect with one another. Three characters, John the Baptist, Jesus, and then in fact the author himself, Matthew. So we begin Matthew chapter 3, verses 1 through 6. It says, in those days, John the Baptist came preaching in the wilderness of Judea, saying, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven has come near you. In our vernacular, it's the kingdom of heaven is here. It's here. This is he who was spoken of through the prophet Isaiah, a voice of one calling in the wilderness, Prepare the way for the Lord, make straight paths for him. John's clothes were made of camel's hair, and he had a leather belt around his waist. His food was locusts and wild honey. People went out to, hear, to, went out to him from Jerusalem and all Judea and the whole region of Jordan, confessing their sins. They were baptized by him in the Jordan River. Matthew does not introduce us to John the Baptist until this point. In fact, he doesn't really introduce Jesus to us very much until this point. Other Gospels give us some more details. Matthew's ready to get right to business. But John the Baptist... His mom was Elizabeth, the cousin to Mary. Now, Elizabeth was at the end of her time of being able to bear children. Mary was at the beginning of the window of having children, but yet they were cousins. 400 years of silence take place from the last words of the prophet Malachi until God breaks the silence with an angel speaking to Zechariah, Elizabeth's husband. And in that moment, he announces to Zechariah that he will give birth to a son, and he he was to name him John, and here becomes this first 400-year break of silence. And then we have the birth of Jesus. That will happen 12 months probably later. And with that, God breaks this physical silence, if you will, that had begun 
4,000 years ago in the garden where God removed himself physically. Now with the birth of Jesus, we have God being present in the flesh with us. We have the breaking of silence and the angel talking to Mary and Joseph about that. And now we begin here. John the Baptist breaks this silence. He breaks the prophetic silence by saying, repent. The kingdom of God has come. Um, after he says the kingdom of God had come, he adds to that this quotation from Isaiah. Isaiah would have been, he, Isaiah is known as the messianic prophet. There are more prophecies from, from Isaiah and also from the Psalms quoted in the New Testament than any other book. So, so I, want you, I want you to understand, John is fully aware of what's going on. He's fully aware of his calling. And he's fully aware of the moment he rests in. Because he says this, A voice of one calling, In the wilderness prepare the way for the Lord. Where was John? John was in the wilderness. Okay, Make straight in the desert a highway for our God. Every valley shall be raised up. Every mountain and hill made low. The rough ground shall become level. The rugged places a plain. And the glory of the Lord will be revealed, and all the people will see it together, for the mouth of the Lord has spoken. The end of that, the end of that chapter in Isaiah says, Even youths grow tired and weary, and young men stumble and fall. But those who hope in the Lord will renew their strength. They will soar on wings like eagles. They will run and not grow weary, and they will walk and not be faint. John knows everybody's weary and everyone has, has been operating without hope and everyone is weak. And he understands that at Christ's appearing, this is changing. And he understands that his role is to point out who this person is that no one else had really recognized as of yet. Sometimes the most powerful people are the least recognizable. And so John's call is to point out who this person is that's been living in their midst this entire time. And he begins by saying, repent, because he's here. Now, there isn't a great, actually, repent is not a great translation of this word. There are other words for repentance. The, the word that John uses is best understood as to turn to turn. It's, it's, a, it's, it's a change of action based on a change of heart, to turn. And if I can just pause here in a minute, we're, we're in a culture right now that wants to shame people into apologies, okay? And, and, and it's, it's for no intent other than to unveil who they are were or are, and keep them in that place so that they cannot move forward. Jesus is, comes for a completely different purpose and perspective. There is a recognition of where I am outside of Christ, but that is a power given so that I will turn and a grace given so that I can go forward. Do you see, do you, do you recognize the difference that, that God isn't looking for an apology? He's looking for a recognition of where I am is not life, and that there is life if I will turn. And his appearance and his presence is what gives us the perspective and the power to do that. All Christianity is not about doing Christianity is about becoming. All doing has to flow from becoming. Then it's, it's a natural byproduct of being transformed by the grace of God. And it happens and we grow into it deeper and deeper and deeper as we follow Christ. Christianity is not a behavioral modification program. It changes our hearts, our whole Nature is changed. And this is what John is saying. You, you, you've been looking and waiting. You're tired and weary. And here comes 
him. Now look, I'm going to baptize you in water. There's going to be a cleansing that happens in baptism. But the one coming after me will baptize with the Holy Spirit, with power, and with fire. In other words, my baptism will cleanse you. His baptism, the fire, will purify you. It will root out that old nature. And he will give you the power to walk in this new nature. This guy coming, you think I'm somebody? That you'd come out here to the wilderness to be baptized by me? Dude, no, I'm not the guy. I've been called to point to the guy, but he's coming. And that's John, that was John the Baptist's role. And he saw it and he understood it and he goes to his death, a horrible death, proclaiming that Jesus is the one that was prophesied. And John fills that role because most of the time you can't point out powerful people. What about Jesus? Jesus is the main character of this chapter, right? Jesus comes walking and he identifies himself to John that, that he needs to be baptized by John. When he shows up, John, John's gospel says that John the Baptist said, Behold the Lamb who takes away the sin of the world. Jesus didn't come that way. He didn't show up and say, I'm the Lamb. He shows up to be baptized. John's like, no, no I, you, we, this is reversal. And Jesus said, no, to fulfill all righteousness, in other words, to fulfill the plan of my Father, you're baptizing me. Why in the world would the King, the Messiah, one without sin, what was the necessity of him being baptized? This ritual baptismal cleansing. I'll tell you why. It is a foreshadowing of the cross. Here is the God-man. No one sees the God part yet. They just see the man part. He's fully God. He's fully man. In three and a half years, he's going to have to walk to a cross and do so knowing he, does, he has done nothing to deserve the cross, but he's doing it in honor and obedience to the Father, his love for us, and on the cross is where sin is nailed and sin is defeated. Scripture says that he who knew no sin became sin for us. Now, if he was going to have to do that in three and a half years, it had to start somewhere, and it starts with his baptism. Would he identify with these people? The people that for 30 years, they don't have no idea who he is. And he goes, and he submits himself to John's baptism because kings come to garner power, Jesus came to serve. And so he stands in the middle of people who wanted the baptism, uh, Pharisees and Sadducees that had come to mock John. And he gets baptized, and when he comes up out of the water, one of the, it's actually depicted in, in ancient art as well. You have, you have Jesus standing in the water, and it said, the Scripture says that the heavens open up. The Spirit descends as an image of a dove. Holy Spirit. So we have, we have God the Son standing in the Jordan. We have the Holy Spirit descending, descending over Jesus. And then you have the voice of the Father saying, This is my Son in whom I am well pleased. So we had 400 years of silence broken by angels. We have 4,000 years of physical silence broken by Jesus' presence. And now we have God breaking the silence himself. This is my son. This begins the ministry of Jesus. He is identified by John, and he is commissioned by his father. And we learn so much about who he is in this first public appearance that he would stand with each of us in all of our mess. And he would go ahead and identify with us not like, oh, I know Maggie. It's no, I am Maggie. That's, that's, big, that's a big difference. No, I know Chris. No, I, I, I am Chris. And that's what we learn about Jesus in Matthew chapter 3. That he had what it took to do that. He was going to walk this thing out. He was going to finish what he started. He's a finisher. What about the third person in Matthew chapter 3? Actually, if you read it closely, there is no third person. 
I added a third person. Matthew. I added the author. Why did I add the author? Well, because all of this is coming from Matthew's perspective. He's the one being given the agenda of writing to identify Jesus as the king. And we have him announce this king. We have him commissioned a king. But through Matthew, we get to early on experience the king. Matthew. He doesn't even talk about himself until Matthew chapter 9. And then he only talks about himself just a little bit. No other gospel records the account of Matthew coming and encountering Jesus. When, when you list out the disciples, it's never Matthew, Peter, James, John. It's always Peter, James, John. I mean, Matthew, he gets kind of locked in the middle like Bartholomew and, Tha and Thaddeus or something. I mean, it's like, who knows who this Matthew guy is? I mean, he's, he's just one of these 12. Th there was some considerable amount of humor in what I just said there, and y'all just staring at me. I just got to give y'all permission to laugh a little bit at 11 o'clock, you know. So, so what I'm trying to indicate here is Matthew isn't, there isn't anything no, no, notorious per se about Matthew, but I would say this. Matthew probably was the furthest one, the furthest one away from the kingdom of God than any of the other 12 that were called. Here, let's look, let's, here, here's his account. Um, it's Matthew chapter 9, 9 through 13. As Jesus went on from there, he saw a man named Matthew sitting at the tax collector's booth. Follow me, he told him. And Matthew got up and followed him. There it is. And then he says, while Jesus was having dinner at Matthew's house, many tax collectors and sinners came and ate with him and his disciples. When the Pharisees saw this, they asked the disciples, Why does your teacher eat with tax collectors and sinners? On hearing this, Jesus said, It's not the healthy who need a doctor, but the sick. But go and learn what this means. I desire mercy, not sacrifice, for I have not come to call the righteous, but sinners. Tax collector. You have to read socially between the lines to understand the impact of this passage. Right? First of all, tax collectors were on the same social plane as prostitutes. Okay. Secondly, a, tax, a Jewish tax collector was considered ceremonially unclean, which means they could not enter the temple, which means they could not offer sacrifice, which means sacrifice could not be offered from them. So at some point in time, here Matthew is completely removed from, from, the, from the God of his culture, removed from Yahweh, from Jehovah. All right? And then tax collectors basically had to turn their back on their family as well as their faith. They had made a conscious decision for money or from whatever reason, because this is a good job. This is a good gig financially. Rome's paying you to collect taxes. You're the Jewish, you're, you, you know, you're, the, you're the feet on the ground, the boots on the ground. You know the people, you know their businesses, you know what they're making. And you get a chance to extract more money than what's owed because that's part of your fee. So from a financial side, it was significant. From a Jewish side, what in the world happened to Matthew that made him do this? What possibly could have happened that he would walk away from his family and his faith? Now, in the Jewish faith, a young boy would have been put in, you know, I can't pronounce all the Hebrew words, so I call it rabbi school. Okay? And, and every phase of rabbi school, you had to pass a different threshold to move on at certain ages. And a lot of, a lot of times that was like the idea of quoting the, the Torah, quoting the five books, of the old, first five books of the Old Testament. And so at some level, any boy that couldn't do that, they were encouraged to go learn a trade. This is where we find, we find fishermen being called as a disciple. See, when you made it to the final level, then there would have been a rabbi that would have said, follow me. And, and, and in the invitation to follow, the rabbi had very um, specific an understanding. You had already been vetted to the point that the rabbi would have believed that you can talk like he talked, teach like he te taught, um, that you would know what he knew, that you'd sound like he would sound. I mean, you were going to be so closely followed. And in fact, I've used this many, many times in here, is that a disciple was considered to have walked so close to the rabbi that they would wear the dust of the feet of the rabbi on them. So once you think about it, Jesus never told, asked a rabbi to come follow him. 
He never poached a, rab, uh, a rabbi's disciple. So everybody Jesus calls out of these 12 had already flunked out of rabbi school. But Jesus said, no. No, you follow me. So think about now he's encountering Matthew. And that's why I said Matthew did more than flunk out of rabbi school. Matthew spurned rabbi school. We have no idea what causes Matthew to go to this extent to be so far away from the God of his fathers and ancestors. And yet, Jesus comes walking by his tax collector's booth. You think random? I think not. Matthew would have had to have been a man of the streets. He would have had to know what was going on. He would have had to hear the commotion about who this Jesus was. Something had to be stirring inside of him. Did I make the right choice? Am I going to have to live in this choice? Maybe he had become dissatisfied in the choice, but there's no way out, no way back. You can't, you can't, take, you can't put this toothpaste back in the tube. My lot is my lot. Because, dude, I mean, there could be more commentary to this, but basically when it says, he said, come follow me, he left. Like he didn't do a final audit to try to sell his book of business. He didn't make one final deposit from the today's receipts. He didn't go make one last withdrawal. It says he got up and followed him. And the next thing we learn is he's getting together all his other tax collecting friends, having a party to introduce him to Jesus. Like my life has so radically turned and changed on this dime. You guys think there's no hope for you too. You think this is all there is. You think you're at the end of the road. I'm telling you, you are not at the end of the road because this guy, Jesus, that we've heard so much about, so much about this, he's the real deal. Matthew's a huge part of the story because Matthew picks up this mantle and 70 years later and says, I'm going to tell these people about the king that I met. He wasn't just an ordinary guy. He didn't, wasn't just a has-been. He didn't just come and go. He just didn't start a rebellion. This guy is Jesus. He's, he is the Messiah. A lot gets told in, in chapter 3 of Matthew. I think it tells us that if you're a follower of Christ, we have been given the same call as Isaiah and John. The kingdom of God is here. It's come. It might not look like it because the kingdom of God is here and not yet. We experience the kingdom of God in the presence of God and the transformation of our life, but we live in a hard time. But listen, no harder than it was in the first century. It hasn't, it's happened and it's still going to happen. And we've been given, we've been given that calling. Because a lot of times, the most powerful person in the room needs to be pointed out. I'll tell you that only one worth following, the only powerful person worth following would be the one someone else has to point out to you. Because Jesus didn't come wielding a crown and a scepter. Tau, basin of water, crown of thorns, some nails, back on a cross. That's who is our established king. Because it was that kind of power necessary to get us to a place where Matthew was throwing a party because he had changed so much. Come on up, Lincoln. This weekend, I got to attend my um, niece's high school graduation. My niece is uh, only a few months younger than my daughter, Annie. Um, but Lydia Joy was, was born with um, something called apraxia. So there was a part of her brain did not form. Um, some motor skills. Um, she communicates actually pretty well, but you would have to be around her a long time before you'd kind of really know what and how she says. She just tells me no a lot, so it's been easy um, for my years. She's like, no. Um, but so... At the end of 21 years in the high school, then you've got to you got to move on and to a, another transitionary kind of school, but you you're just mainstreamed in this graduation ceremony. It's huge high school. There's 400 graduates, 
right? And so she's walking in with the graduates, sitting in the line of graduates. We met one of her teachers at a party, and he said how, all, how long they had to go over all the processes so the kids would be comfortable in how they were doing this. And while I was a little nervous, you know, but she walked across the stage like a boss, man. I mean, she didn't even want the diploma. She just knew she was going to shake hands and go back to sit, right? So she's, she's, she's getting across the stage, and the principal gets her and gives her a diploma, gets a big smile. And we're in this 5,000-seat auditorium, and she's back to her seat. And then, um, you know, not a lot of emotion. You could tell she was excited how she walked across the stage. But then my brother-in-law, after they all, pro- pro- uh, what is it, recessed out or whatever the word is, right? He goes and gets her, and he brings her around to where we are. And when she, now she knew we were coming. And when she walked in those doors and she saw us, she just started screaming. Biggest eyes, biggest smile. Ah! And she'd go, and my, 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 my father-in-law was the first person she saw. And so she just grabbed him and hugged him and gave him this, like, 10-minute kiss. I mean, it was just crazy, right, all the expression. And then my, my sister-in-law had to take her and show her who else was there because she was so locked in to one person. And then every person she'd say, Liddy, look over here. Here's Aunt Gina. Ah! And she, I mean, like eight of us, nine of us just kept going. Me, she grabbed the flowers I had. She went on to the next person. But... I mean, she knew, she knew we were coming. And yet she had all this, this pent-up excitement and energy of her graduation that when she saw us, she just went crazy. And I cried sitting there. Look, I knew what I was preaching, right? I mean, I didn't write this between midnight and 3 a.m., right? And so I'm sitting there and going, that's how I'd like to see Jesus. Lord, would that be my expression to you? John's standing in the middle of the river. Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. What? I get to meet you now? Unbelievable. You want me to do what? No, I can't do that. That's for you to, no, no, no. You come down here. No, oh, what? Okay. Okay. And then he witnesses the dove and the voice of God. This is my son, you know, well pleased. What? I'm witnessing ancient history come about in front of my very eyes. We were all so excited to get to go to the graduation. So excited to stand up among the 5,000 saying, waving at Lydia Joy. Matthew chapter 3 gives us all the opportunity to be so excited about the person who changed their life and were a follower of Christ. We get to point him out to people. That we have changed so dramatically that we would gather together the people around us that haven't changed. And, and say, this is... Why why does John the Baptist dress so weird and eat such crazy food? But it wasn't as weird or as crazy in that century. But it was enough for Matthew to notice. Camel hair tunic with a belt. I mean, I think that must have just been to accentuate his waist. Because I I I mean, it's that specific. It says camel hair tunic, a belt. And then it goes into his diet, honey and locusts. Here's how I see that. If I would put that in a modern day parable, what is there about my life that I'm so passionate about who he is that it would, it would impact how I live, how to dress, what I eat, where I go, what I talk about, that it would draw, because John, John, John wasn't gathering people to himself. John didn't gather people to himself. He garnered all this attention and pointed to Christ. So here's where I want to land the plane. Just, just like there, there's no randomness of Jesus walking by Matthew's tax collector's booth that day and say, follow me. There is no randomness 
to you being in the room today or watching online or even those who will pull this up maybe a month later and watch it as an archive. God doesn't do random. What have you been wrestling with? stuck, tired, uh, already too far down this road, can't make the turn or the decision, and you just have settled and said, I guess this is just gonna how it's going to have to be. And I, and I would say that you might have made that determination, but you're still watching, or you're still listening to the podcast, or you're still here in the room, which means that you have to be looking for something else. And the same thing Jesus did for Matthew he can do for you. You aren't any further away than Matthew was. Matthew was pretty far away. Matthew had burnt a lot of bridges. Jesus restores bridges. He is the original bridge. He bridges us to his Father. So in this morning, I've done my best John the Baptist representation. Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. And if that takes making you laugh a little bit, cry a little bit, that's what it takes. So when I pray in a moment, I encourage you to do what Matthew did. He didn't do a final edit, an audit of his books to try to sell and get out clean. He left a lot on the table. You with me? He was a tax collector. There was money on the table. He left. Now look, now I, I, didn't, I, didn't, I didn't describe it this way in the first service, so there's a reason. There was a, there, there was a lot left on the table he was already sitting at. He had to make the decision that where he was going was more valuable than where he was. That was a conscious decision, but he was ready. There was no debate. He had already lived through enough hell. That he didn't want to live through another day out. And maybe that's what you you feel. You've lived through enough hell. I don't want to go through another day out don't have to. Father, you have come by this place today to communicate with your people. Lord, to call us to make your name great where we live, with the people that you've put around us. And as Magnificent as you are, you have to be pointed out. You've just ordained it that way. And Lord, I pray for the followers of Christ in this room today, Lord, that they would be willing to get in a camel-haired tunic in order to draw attention to you. That there would be something significant about what we do, what we say, how we say it, where we say it, where we go, where we don't go, what we do, what we don't do, who we do things with, who we don't do things with. There would be enough different about who we are that when people come to us, that we would point them to you. How do you do this? Well, let me tell you about Jesus. Why'd you do this? Let me tell you about Jesus. How come you're like that? Let me tell you about Jesus. Lord, I pray for the people in the room. And again, those watching, those listening, at whatever day and time, Lord, as you have been stirring them, that it's time to change. And they can change. And they can turn. Because you are the real king. You are the real Messiah. This is what you do. 
you're, the best thing you do is resurrections. And you're here to resurrect some lives, some futures, some presents. Everyone's praying. And I, I, I just think it's an important gesture. But if that's you, that you would raise your hand and say, Pastor, that's me today. If you're watching, I encourage you to raise your hand. If you're driving down your road, listen to podcasts. I encourage you to raise one of your hands. This is me, Lord. I want to leave it all on the table and follow you. Anyone in the room today? I'll leave it all on the table and follow you today. Yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. Lord, your word's plain. You've done the heavy lifting. You're the one who went to the cross. You're the one who nailed our sins to the cross. You're the one who defeated death, hell, and the grave. You are the one who gave and gives new life. And You haven't asked us to do anything. You've asked us to surrender our life to you and then allow you to shape us that we would become like you. Thank you for coming by this tax booth today. Thank you for walking down to this river today, meeting us where we are. In your name we pray. Amen. You know, you know where the word Christian came from? It actually was a term of derision. It actually was a, a negative term. Um, and that little Christ, you're, you're, you're trying to be a little Christ. First century, it was a, it was a slam. And yet we wear it today as a follower of Christ, wear it proudly. That, yeah, that's my goal. That was every follower of a rabbi's goal. I want to be like the rabbi. And every rabbi only chose the people who he believed could do that. And Jesus chooses us. So that means he believes that we can be like him. And he empowers that. He doesn't just point. Jesus is not a pointer. You do not lead by pointing. Pointing is not a leadership trait. Walking is a leadership trait. Leading is a leadership trait. He goes before us. Come follow me. I'll show you how to do it. Come follow me. I'll show you how to do it. If you're a guest with us today, it's been great having you part of our worship service. We understand that it's never easy walking into a new place with new people. And you took that risk today, and we're grateful that you did that. So much so, we expected you to be here. We have a gift for you. We'd love to give that to you. Right outside these double doors, there's a big C, and there's a team there. We'd love to meet you, uh, learn your name, and give you that gift. Uh, let's stand for the benediction. Let me say thank you to everyone who is responding so far to our Finish Strong if you did not receive a letter or an email describing Finish Strong, our effort to, when we go into the, uh, to the new building, that we would be able to pay cash for all the furnishings. If you didn't get a letter or an email describing that, um, it's because we either don't have a current or correct email or address, and we'd love to get that um, to let you know what, what that's all about. But those of you who have already responded or are praying a response, thank you that the response is going very well so far. Um, now may the Lord bless you and keep you. May he make his face shine on you, be gracious to you, and grant you peace. And you're rising up, you're laying down, you're going out and coming in both now and forevermore. God bless you. Enjoy your Sunday afternoon.